Welcome to Brain Hunter, where we interview millennial entrepreneurs, commentators, scientists, execs, and everything in between, here to inspire and educate. With me today, I have Zarek Bagdadlian, a second generation jeweler based in New York City, who started her own namesake brand in November 2019. Her brand, called Zarek Jewels, currently boasts more than three collections, including one bridal collection, and is centered around good quality, good craftsmanship, and of course, giving back. Zarek? I'm so excited to have you here. I'm so excited to be here. I have so many questions about, <laughs> about your brand and I absolutely love interviewing women entrepreneurs because I think there's there's so much creativity and, and there, there's so much power that this brings into the game. And I just want to talk about Zark Jewels and what inspired you to create it. I know your family has been in the business for, for years. Mm -hmm. And so what pushed you one day to wake up and say, this is what I want to do. I want to build my own amazing brand and Zark Jewels is the way forward. Well, ever since I was a kid, I loved going to work with my dad. I was like, I, the earliest memories I have is going to 47th Street here in New York with my dad and him stopping every five steps saying hi to this person and that person and seeing, and it's a very heavily male dominated industry to begin with. So ever since I was a kid, I, we would go to the auction houses and I loved seeing jewelry. Like I, sometimes even when I need ins inspiration, I would just walk up and down 47th Street just to see what jewelry is going mm -hmm. on. I love looking at jewelry. Mm -hmm. And then, so when I went to, but I actually went to school for fashion merchandising. So I got my business administration, fashion merchandising. And then I realized very early on, after I interned for a high-end fashion company, Stella McCartney, I realized that this isn't for me. And then why not? I just for me at the time too, this was in 2008 mm -hmm. at the time people were really being taken advantage of in the fashion world and then years later there was a lot of lawsuits brought up against a lot of these major fashion brands and I just like saw that the way people were treated wasn't something that I wanted to be a part of mm -hmm. and I and I just got turned off I love fashion and clothing and everything but it, it just wasn't the right fit for me mm -hmm. And then I got an internship at the Marketing Media and Public Relations Department at Turno, which is the largest watch retailer in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where my eyes were opened. I mean, I love the world, like the luxurious world. Even though I'm not a huge watch person, it's the craftsmanship, the craftsmanship yeah. and the quality and everything behind it. And then I learned like the marketing aspect behind mm -hmm. it as well. And then I went to, after I graduated college, I went to GIA and I got my graduate gemologist in diamonds as well as colored stones, oh, gemstones. Wow. I mean, I, the diamonds was like fun, okay, straightforward, and, and my father's in the diamond industry, so I've, I've, I've seen some of the rarest, most incredible diamonds in the world, but gemstones was a whole other world for me because my dad only deals with diamonds. Mm. So for me, gemstones was just like, wow, moonstones and aquamarine and What's all this new stuff? and it's like, <laughs> there's so much fun you you can have with these stones it's, it's creative it's very creative like you can really have so much fun so right now i'm making like a pair of earrings with moonstones i'm oh, really excited to see how they look i got my graduate gemologist and then i worked for my father for a couple of years and that was really wonderful just to see how he ran his business mm -hmm. and just learning like from paperwork i got my master's in art law and business at wow. christie's in london and it's th accredited through university of glasgow mm -hmm. Love it. And I loved it. I mean, I'm, first of all, my father was like, what? But there's a program in New York. I was like, but I need to be in London. <laughs> I need to like just get what away from it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. One thing that I was so, un that I really learned that really upset me was the vast underrepresentation of female artists in the institutional space. So for me, I was like, whatever I do in the future, I, I want to help give back mm -hmm to getting female artists in the institutional mm -hmm. space. Now, what does that mean? It means being in the museum. So when an artist becomes part of the permanent collection of let's say Guggenheim mm -hmm. or the Metropolitan Museum of Mo or MoMA, that really elevates their career right. and that so many people get to see their work. They get visibility. Exactly. They get Exactly. Right. For me, and, and, a, and a female led anonymous art group called the Gorilla Girls really has been bringing this to life for the past 30 years. The Gorilla Girls. Yeah, the Gorilla Girls. And they're at Tate Modern, mm -hmm. and they have a lot of pieces on display there that's mm -hmm. very like eye opening. And, you, and I got to meet one of them, so they literally wear gorilla like outfits. That's insane. But I got to meet them in London, and I yeah. took pictures with them, and I was like, this is so cool. 
we buy rough diamonds, we cut it, we make a jewelry piece out of it. Sometimes we sell at auction houses, sometimes we sell to private clients, sometimes we sell to the top diamond brands in the world, such as, I can't really name anyways. <laughs> Scrap that. <laughs> exactly. But Zach Jewels, how and then, do you different? So, at, and that was the moment where I was just like, okay, there's such a small limited amount of people that can afford these diamonds. But I want to make jewelry that's high quality. I want it to be the same quality as Cartier, as Tiffany. Mm -hmm. And I want to use 18 karat gold. And I, one thing that I really found very frustrating when I was shopping online for jewelry brands is they don't list the quality of the diamonds. Mm -hmm. And to the normal consumer, that's like, no, 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 nobody, nobody looks at it. Yeah. But I'm not gonna spend so much money on something where it's not listed. What is the quality? Even if I wouldn't understand it, I can go and teach myself and look it up and learn. Thousand percent transparent. I am telling you what's in my jewelry. Mm -hmm. I am telling you that they're colored sapphires. I'm telling you that they're G color diamonds, VS qual clarity diamonds. Everything is 18 karat gold. And it's interesting because all of the different millennial entrepreneurs that I have interviewed are being led by this rise in transparency in their yeah. businesses. Simply because, and I keep saying this, it's because we are becoming more accountable by virtue of the character of the society we live in. Like people can go on Google and they can they can look at reviews about mm -hmm. your brand and they can look at reviews about this other brand and they can make a decision and they can look at what you do to give back and we'll get to that in a second. I know you mentioned it, but I would love to hear more about it. And so just by virtue of the society that we live in, we as millennial entrepreneurs need to show what it is that we're working towards and and what we're being inspired by. And it seems like transparency and accountability is, is definitely within your agenda as well. Exactly. It's it's very important for me to just I tell you what it is, and and then and you make your decision. If you and you make the decision, but I am a thousand percent open, mm -hmm. telling you what's in my jewelry, what's in my diamonds, mm -hmm. and where do most jewels come from? Where in in what? general, yours. Oh, my so, jewelry. Yeah. Well, everything is made either in New York or Asia. As a jewelry brand, is that like the craftsmanship is there? It's not like it's being made in like sweatshops in the middle of a, like a little village in and a, a number of China. Of brands have come under oh, yeah. intense scrutiny, and and those have been named in some of the other episodes because I was interviewing Ashita, who has created a rental app by mm -hmm. rotation. Uh, she's incredible, and she was saying this exact thing. That's the whole point of, for example, her brand, where she wants to bring awareness to the fact that. You know, if you can't afford more clothes, don't get more yeah. clothes because the way those clothes are made are not going to make you super happy when you find out about it because people get paid minimum mm -hmm. wage and, and people are getting, you know, exploited for them. And, and so I, I love that. That's, and that's the thing. Like, your mind, in so. the jewelry world, like for me, I'm somebody who's like, buy one thing, but buy something good nice, quality. good quality. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're going to buy something that's like inexpensive mm -hmm. online, a whim, like my pieces isn't like something that like people make, it's not an impulse buy. Mm -hmm. It's something you think about, you really like it, but then when you come to me, you're like, no, you really want this. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about the, the difficulties really of starting your business, you know, three, four months. Mm -hmm. What was it before the pandemic? You know, people are struggling. Mm -hmm. they, they don't know whether they have enough to spend on the essentials. You have a luxury brand. How do you navigate that? Yes. So <laughs> I had launched my brand in November 2019, and then four months later, in March, the pandemic hit. And I had so many plans. I was I was working on like new pieces, new collections. I was I, I had so many plans for the summer. The pandemic has been really incredible for me in the sense of stop and to be more creative. Mm -hmm. And so I started to paint. I started to draw more. I started to just look at pieces different ways. I mean, I'll come up with a hundred designs and five of them will get made. Mm -hmm. So like you're always like adding, subtracting, what makes it different, what makes it unique. So it really made me slow down and just be much more in the creative process. Mm -hmm. A lot of my business comes from bridal. I do custom bespoke engagement rings. And, and we all know a lot of people got engaged. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So that was like really interesting to see. The like, grace. Exactly, <laughs> it definitely helped me a lot. It's your baby, you know, mm -hmm. it's your brand, you're proud of it, you've created, it's, it carries your name. You mm -hmm. know, there's no greater responsibility that comes, that comes with that. Mm -hmm. What is like one personal story that you have from one of your customers where you took that even more personally than usual? Mm -hmm. Like what was, you know, something you want to share? I'm in, I'm in an industry, I'm so lucky to be in an industry where I'm people where they're the happiest. 
It's so joy. when they're when they're <laughs> proposing, when there there's so much love, when there's a baby push present, when there's a birthday, like I'm there. And I mean it's it's such a pleasure to be with people during the happiest moments of their lives. Right. And I did like the engagement rings of literally some of my best friends. Uh, personal stories. Exactly. You're, you're, you're part of someone's story and that there's a lot of accountability that comes with that. And I want to ask about branding. I was reading a research where 70% of people say that it is very important to them what their favorite brands mm -hmm. do to give back and for their corporate responsibility. So I know you mentioned the Gorilla mm -hmm. Girls, but is that the main aspect of giving back in your business and empowering young artists and putting their work in the museums? I think that's incredible. Yeah, so for me, I have young acquisitions coming out of a major New York museum, and for me, mm -hmm. the plan is basically to help give some sort of funds mm -hmm. to the museum for a young contemporary female artist that I mm -hmm. love and I mm -hmm. believe in. So for me, and for other museums as well too, not just the museum I'm associated with. So that's something that's very important because I consider like the kinds of jewelry I create, it's, it's art, mm -hmm. it's wearable art, and it's giving back to another female artist. If you were to sit down with a young woman like yourself that wants to start her own jewelry business, what three pieces of advice would you give to her? Well, I feel like I'm still that young woman who started her jewelry business. So for me... What do you um, wish you knew back in November 2019? Be creative mm -hmm. and be original. Mm -hmm. One thing that I, I, I've seen before of like other designers or young and up and coming, they copy or they take extreme creative licenses mm -hmm. from other jewelry brands or up and coming jewelry brands. I mean, I see that a lot. I you mean, want it to be unique. You want it to be unique. Because they're going to not... Tiffany's if you're exactly copying. you want it to be unique you change one or two different things and you get away with and it. you get away with it but what a lot of exactly like these do, people like, like bloggers have gone called out on this so much but so I think that's like just that's terrible it's terrible and it's out there and it's happened and it's going to continue to happen it's not going to not happen so I think like one thing that's just really important is to have your own creativity and do it because you truly love it. And it comes through, you know, if you have this enthusiasm and this, mm -hmm. this commitment to your brand, it comes through. Like I speak to you and I see how excited you are about mm -hmm. I was like, yeah. I just feel that you want to be part of people's stories. Yeah. Like it's, it's it's palpable where where I want to buy some stuff. <laughs> <myself. laughs> and then made this commitment on air, so <laughs> it has to mean something. And I want to finish off by asking you a little bit about the future of Zarek Jewels and and where do you want to go? Obviously you have three collections now mm -hmm. plus your bridal collection mm -hmm. which really blew up during the pandemic. Where do you see yourself and your brand going moving forward? So now I'm in the middle of I just finished designing around like 20 new pieces. Wow. So the plan is for this year once the pieces are they're in manufacturing right now mm -hmm. once all of that is ready i'll have a photo shoot mm -hmm. i'll like pho photograph all the pieces put them all up on the website mm -hmm. i'm in the middle of creating my second lookbook my first lookbook is on my website which you can see mm -hmm. to get into contact with a couple luxury e-commerce retailers such as Netta Corte or Matches Fashion mm -hmm. Moro Operandi uh, Goob so for me it's just if I can get one sort of like contract with them, the person who doesn't know me, they might, you know, feel more comfortable buying pieces through me through another luxury e-commerce brand, which is completely understandable. So my goal is to get onto a couple of luxury e-commerce retail websites. Mm -hmm. And then after that, hopefully do a trunk show in Mykonos or something. <laughs> <laughs> that would not be bad at all. I would attend this, Thanks, Thank you so, so much for Thank today. You. I appreciate it. I learned so much about jewels that I had no idea about mm -hmm. and I understand how important creativity is and originality and I just I can feel this coming mm -hmm. um, from you so um, thank you so much thank you for having me thank Faze you. already begun it's that new age yeah they can't hold us back we on another level yeah it's that new age ain't it something special yeah we gonna change the game